Okay, this is chapter 38, and this is Endocrine System. It's an overview of the system function and assessment. And I am going to share my screen with you guys. And let's get going. And so here we go, chapter 38, Endocrine. So the first thing we're gonna do is go over the objectives like we always do. You have to know what the glands of the endocrine system are. And then what are the functions of the hormones in the, in the endocrine system coming from those glands? Always we talk about the effects of aging on the endocrine system, what kind of data you have to collect, questions to ask when you're assessing a patient with an endocrine disorder, and what is the nursing care for patients undergoing testing or having issues with the endocrine system. So here, just a quick review of A and P. The endocrine system consists of, first and foremost, in the brain, the pituitary gland, and the hypothalamus. And I can't take credit for this. I, I heard Dr. Tish using this one, so I stole it. The pituitary gland is the dad. I call him the king, the king, the dad. Pituitary gland really controls everything else in the endocrine system, but can't make a move without the approval of the mom or the queen, which is the hypothalamus. So you'll find, and this will make more sense later, a lot of disorders in the endocrine system can be traced back to a problem or a tumor of the pituitary gland, okay? The pineal gland is also there in the brain. We're not gonna go over that. That is the one that is responsible for producing um, melatonin, which is how you go sleep. Here in the throat, you've got the thyroid, and that's a big deal. And on either side, you have parathyroid glands. Your thyroid gland is the only gland in the endocrine system that you can actually palpate. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. And on either side, the parathyroids, they're teeny tiny. Parathyroids control a hormone called calcitonin. And calcitonin is the hormone that's in charge of calcium how much calcium is in your blood and how much calcium is in your bones. That is calcitonin's job. Your thyroid gland produces T3 and T4, other hormones too, but they're the ones we'll talk about. And the thyroid maintains your metabolic rate. In other words, how much energy does it take for you to just be alive, right? Not really doing anything, just sitting there, just to be alive. That's the thyroid. In the center of the chest, kind of behind the sternum is the thymus gland. The thymus gland in children is super big. And as they get older, it shrinks. Why? Because there are types of white blood cells that are called T cells. And this is an easy way to remember this. T cells are trained in the thymus. So T cells, T memory cells are the white blood cells that will remember different types of pathogens and help you fight against them later on. The theory with autoimmune disorders is that when the T cells are getting trained in the thymus gland, something goes wrong. And so the T cells are confused about what is your stuff and what are pathogens or foreign bodies. So, and that's one theory, it's not proven, okay? And we're not gonna get into anything more about the thymus. You have, these are your kidneys, okay? And these two little things on top of each kidney, those are your adrenal glands. Your adrenal glands are super important because they work in conjunction with the kidneys in maintaining fluid volume balance in the body. And they, they help with antidiuretic hormone, angiotensin, um, which is a chemical that helps to control vol the volume of fluid. So those are the adrenal glands. And then right here is your pancreas. Your pancreas is unique because it's an endocrine gland, but it also has exocrine functions. So exocrine, it's part of your digestive system, believe it or not. So it produces these hormones, amylase and lipase that help you digest starches and fats. But for endocrine, that pancreas, it makes insulin. And you need insulin in order to metabolize carbohydrates, which are sugars. Okay, so that's the pancreas. Now, there are also other organs, you know, the ovaries for the female and the testes for the male. These are the sex organs. We are not going to get into those. You'll do that next term, term four. Okay. So in, for our intents and purposes, 
we're going to be talking about the pancreas, the adrenals, parathyroids, and thyroid. Okay, they're the ones. So there's a little bit of, you know, a little more specific A and P here. I'm not going to go over that because you don't really, you know, that's not something that we need to cover. But this page here goes through the different hormones. Okay. And this can be a little confusing, because, especially when it comes to thyroid, because TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, comes from the pituitary gland. But T3 and T4 come from the thyroid. So I'm going to go over this as we talk about the actual diseases. Okay. And there's some of them you don't need to know, like you don't need to know about prolactin. You're going to do that in maternal newborn, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone, reproductive. You're going to talk about that in term four. Okay. So we don't cover that here. All right. So moving right along. So here is a really good representation of your thyroid. Okay. So the anterior of your throat, it like is right over the trachea, right? That is the thyroid gland. It's kind of wrapped around the trachea, okay? If you've ever seen anybody with a goiter, and that's where that thyroid gland gets super, super enlarged, you know, then it's, it's you can visibly see it. But when you are assessing a patient, you can ask the patient to hyperextend their head, in other words, head back, and ask them to swallow. And when you put your hands right here, right about at the, where the trachea is, when they swallow, you can just feel part of the thyroid gland. It's the only endocrine gland that you can actually palpate. Okay. Then, so the thyroid gland, see these little purple things, itty bitty little purple things? They're your parathyroids. I mean, they are tiny. And this is going to make sense when we talk about thyroid disease, because if you need a thyroidectomy, if you need to have your thyroid removed, guess what happens a lot? They remove these guys along with the thyroid. They're so little, it's almost, you know, almost inevitable. And then that's a whole nother set of issues, but we'll talk about that later, okay? When we get to thyroid. And next, so here you're looking at, this is the digestive system, okay? And the pancreas, Here's a pretty good representation. It's right kind of behind your stomach, okay? And it's got like the head of the pancreas is kind of tucked into the curve of your small intestine and a tail reaches all the way down to your spleen. And your pancreas, like I said, super, super, super important because of its ability to manufacture and excrete insulin. And it also can manufacture and excrete glucagon, which is a form of sugar. Okay, and that's important. And when we get to diabetes mellitus, you'll see why. The effects of aging. So just like everything else, aging takes its toll on every system in the body. Endocrine system is no different. So as we get older, you don't have as much growth hormone. So that's why like, you know, number one, I'm not getting any taller. JK, there's a decrease in muscle mass with aging that does occur unless you work to try to keep it, you know, active. But, you know, that's a sad effect of aging. Muscle mass will start to decrease. TSH, right? Thyroid stimulating hormone and T3 and T4, thyroid hormones will start to go down. Here you go. You ever see most old people are usually complaining of, oh, it's cold. It's cold. Why? Has to do with that decrease in those thyroid hormones because now their metabolism is slowing down, right? Thyroid controls your metabolic rate. When the thyroid is slowing down, the production of the hormone slows down, your metabolic rate slows down, you're cold and you don't have as much energy. You're like, oh. and then a decrease in the secretion of insulin, which can, doesn't have to, but can lead to something called a glucose intolerance. It's not the same thing as diabetes, but it can cause severe weight gain um, and some other, some other problems. It's not really diabetes. I don't get into that, but it is, it is good to know. So the best thing you can do, you know, with aging, and I tell patients this as well, is to stay active, right? Try to keep as active as you can throughout the aging process. So these, you know, these things don't become as prominent a problem as they could. When you're assessing a patient, okay, we're talking about endocrine now, 
of course, you're going to get a health history. You want to assess neuromuscular, in other words, because think about it. Parathyroid glands, calcitonin, calcitonin affects calcium, calcium affects nerves and reflexes. So you want to check their reflexes. What's their response, right? Do they have reflexes that are intact? Have they lost or gained weight without trying, just unintentionally? Do they have excessive thirst or find themselves peeing all the time? And you'll see with diabetes mellitus and also with diabetes insipidus, you, you'll have things like polyuria, which is peeing all the time, polydipsia, which is excessive thirst. Have you suddenly become intolerant to either heat or cold, right? So that's important because that speaks to thyroid function. How's your mood? Has your mood been labile? The word labile means up and down. So in other words, are you happy? Then you're sad. Then you're happy. Then you're sad. Has your mood been labile? Have you had any memory loss? And then of course, family history, because these, you know, these disorders do tend to run in families, right? Physical assessment, of course, vital signs, weight. You're going to look at skin. Remember, you're assessing a patient the minute you lay eyes on them. You're looking at their hair, their skin, their posture, the way they carry themselves. Do they look healthy and well nourished, right? Do they look their age, like age appropriate or older or younger than their age, right? Um, things like tremors and speaks to, you know, issues with calcium, right? What's their affect like? In other words, your affect is the expression on your face. So if I'm talking about a fun thing that happened last week, I should be smiling, right? If my affect is just blunt, kind of like with schizophrenia, right? When you guys did mental health, you, you will sometimes see this very flat expression. That's worrisome too, because that can um, speak to um, cortisol problems, which Addison's and Cushing's disease. And we'll get to that later. Do they have googly eyes? And I'm not being funny, but exophthalmus, and you need to know that. Exophthalmus is, Wendy Williams has it. It is a bulging. Their eyes are like, boing. They almost look like they're bulging out of their head. Um, and exophthalmus is due to something called Graves disease, which is the number one cause of hyperthyroidism. So that's a big red flag if you see that. Do they have pads of fat in places where there should not ought to be pads of fat? When we talk about Cushing's disease, something called a buffalo hump. It's not kyphosis, so, but it kind of looks like it's a hunchback. But what it is, is accumulated fat at the base of the neck that makes them look like they have a hump. Okay, and that's a sign of Cushing's. And then can you see a bulging thyroid? In other words, a goiter. Is there, you know, is there something bulging out of their neck? Well, if that's the case, kind of leads you in the right direction, right? Lab tests, okay? So, and we're gonna go into more detail when we get to the other chapters, but thyroid, we're gonna be looking at the TSH and we're gonna be looking at T3 and T4. And let me just try to give you, I'm gonna lay the groundwork for this now. When your thyroid is hyperactive, hyperactive, okay? Your T3 and T4 are elevated. So your T3 and T4 are doing whatever your thyroid is doing, but your TSH is the opposite. So TSH is high, your thyroid activity is low. And TSH is low when your thyroid activity is high. TSH has an inverse relationship to your thyroid activity, okay? And that is a board question, right? It's content. So you need to remember that. So if your thyroid's hyperactive, your TSH will be low. If your thyroid is hypoactive, your TSH will be high. They are the opposite of each other. But the T3 and the T4 are whatever the thyroid is doing, they're going along for the ride. Thyroid is hyperactive, T3 and T4 are high. Thyroid hypoactive, T3 and T4 low. And then when it comes to the parathyroid, there are hormones and phosphorus we look at, but calcium is the one that I want you to be aware of in relationship to the parathyroid glands, okay? When we look at pancreatic function, so we're talking about diabetes. 
you need to know that a fasting blood glucose is between 60 and 100. And an easy way to remember the number, normal heart rate is 60 to 100. And so is a fasting blood sugar, 60 to 100. Then you have something called an oral glucose tolerance test. Okay, you'll sometimes see it called a GTT. Don't confuse that with GTT in little letters like that means drops. GTT is the glucose tolerance test. And they do it a lot for gestational diabetes, but they can do it for regular diabetes as well. So you fast and you go into the lab or the doctor's office and they give you this delicious, very sweet drink to drink. And it's, it's a carbohydrate loaded drink. You drink the drink, you wait an hour to two hours, they check your blood sugar. They're looking to see if your body is responding, your pancreas is responding to all that sugar that you just drank by releasing insulin so that your blood sugar is not elevated. 140 or less is considered normal. 141 to 200 is questionable. If you're higher than 200, you're diabetic, okay? And then the third test is hemoglobin A1C, but it's also called glycosylated hemoglobin. The word glycosylated literally translates to coated with sugar. So we're looking at your hemoglobin to see how much sugar is stuck on it, okay? It's not a blood sugar. It's a glycosylated hemoglobin, hemoglobin A1C. If you are not a diabetic, we're looking for four to 6%. That is normal. If you are a diabetic, the goal is to keep you under 7%. And a glycosylated hemoglobin or a hemoglobin A1C, it gives us pretty much a 90 day window into what has this patient's blood sugar been doing for the past three months? So when you see a patient, they come in for a follow-up and they bring their little log and they tell you, yeah, my blood sugars have been really good. My fasting blood sugar was 140 today and it was 110 the other day and they go through. But then you look at their hemoglobin A1C and it's 12%. What that is telling you is that, you know, I'm not saying that they're lying, but it's telling you that there's been episodes of elevated blood sugars for periods of time, so much so that the sugar has been able to stick and cling to their hemoglobin. It's 12% for hemoglobin A1C is high, right? Because remember, if they're diabetic, we're looking for less than 7%. So it helps us, gives us a 90 day window of what their blood sugars have been. And it helps us understand a couple of things. Like maybe is their medication regimen not appropriate? Are they compliant? with their medication regimen, I mean, we have questions, right? So that gives us a lot of good information. Hemoglobin A1C is a non-fasting test. Fasting blood glucose, well, obviously that's fasting. Oral glucose tolerance test, fasting, okay? We've got, oh, and now we are to the questions at the end of the chapter. So I told you that was a pretty quick one because that's just assessment and function. So I am going to stop the recording and we're gonna do some Q&A. Hope you enjoyed that. It was short and sweet to the point. See you next time. And that's all she wrote for today.